Good morning, everyone. Um, I know it seems early for some people, maybe people who are out on the town last night, but um, actually we've got some people joining us online at 3 a.m. from South Africa and 4 a.m. from Addis Ababa. So um, it's far earlier for them if it's feeling <laughs> rough this morning. This is the um, IGF uh, Open Forum. Uh, the, on the program is 166, the African Union Approach on Data Governance. The African um, Union policy, uh, Data Policy Framework was um, passed early last year by member states, agreed by member states. Um, very comprehensive uh, data governance framework, not just a data protection framework, which it often um, gets condensed to in many of these discussions. Um, and very much uh, a part of the broader continental developments around the digital transformation strategy. Um, the digital transformation strategy very much leveraging or being leveraged by, I should also say, by the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement that was also became operational um, a little time before that. But the uh, digital services protocol is part of the second round negotiations that are currently underway, and I think we're going to get some nice updates on that from this um, fantastic team. So um, I'm going to get uh, uh, Ms. Suhila um, Amazous to speak from the African Union to tell us a bit more about this very comprehensive uh, data policy framework. But we are going to frame these discussions today um, around the excellent trade expertise we have, um, uh, both here and, and in the room and, and also online. Um, but also just because it's, you know, it, this is such a critical aspect of getting the uh, continental free trade area to work unless these digital underpinnings are in place, unless we have these frameworks in place, um, these, you know, it's going to be a very uneven um, common market that we are going to see. So um, without much ado, because we've got a very big panel, if our people on board are, are waking up. Um, so let's begin right away. Um, with um, Ms. Suhila Amazous, um, who has been leading the African Union Data Policy uh, Framework project um, from, um, from the start. And um, she is um, the uh, Senior ICT Policy Officer at the Information Society Division of the African Union. Um, and she contributes to the elaboration and formulation of continental policies. She's been, as I said, very involved, um, obviously within the broader context of Agenda 2063 in the digital transformation strategy and then specifically responsible for these two mandates that arise from these two critically enabling uh, mandates that arise from the digital transformation strategy, the data policy framework, and then there's another digital ID interoperability framework and I think most of you who are following the sort of G20 discussions and various of these uh, glo global digital compact discussions will note that these are some of the foundational infrastructures that we need in place for um, digital public infrastructures. So this inf um, enabling framework is, is very critical to that process. And Suhila, hopefully we have you on board, uh, or online I should say, um, please come in and, and, and do tell us a little bit about this uh, broader framework and perhaps later we can get into some of the more detail around enabling um, data flows and, and, and uh, digital services um, trade. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, do you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you, Sahila. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. As you mentioned, like for me, it's very early. It is 4 a.m. in Addis Ababa. So thank you for uh, joining us in this session, which is about the common African approach on data governance. I thank also Alison, Alison for taking care of the moderation of the panel and also for the introduction of this uh, framework. So this AU data policy framework, it's, it reflects the, uh, as I said, the, the common approach of, of the African countries on data policy and data governance. It was adopted by the African Union Summit in February 22. And uh, the development process of this uh, comprehensive document that addresses data from personal, non-personal, and also from value creation to uh, uh, cross-border data flows to making data available, it addresses uh, all aspects related to data. So the process of its development was collaborative and participatory as we 
engaged with all original organizations and institutions dealing with the data across the continent. And also we organized an online consultation that was open to all uh, stakeholders. So the main objective of this framework is to raise uh, political awareness on strategic importance of data and uh, also pave the way to the development of the uh, digital economy and uh, society. And uh, because like we believe that there is huge amount of data that is being generated across the continent by the public institutions, by private sector, and also by citizens. And this, this data is being is not being used. And also, we don't know how uh, this data is, uh, is managed uh, by other uh, structures. So the, uh, the ProBox aims to create conditions for African countries to harness, to harness the potential of data and also to enable citizens to have control over this data. So the framework either is based on a number of uh, guiding principles, such as trust, uh, fairness, safety, accountability, and also cooperation, because we aim to, to implement the principle of solidarity and collaboration among African countries, and this in line with the, the vision of the African Union towards developing an integrated continent. So the framework defines a number of preconditions or enablers that we need to meet in, able, in order to take advantage of this uh, resource, namely the digital infrastructure, the connectivity, and also the adequate uh, legal and regulatory frameworks, and also the, uh, the institutional arrangements that we need to put in place. Because like some countries are in the process of developing their national data policies, but others, they are at early stage of developing their national legislation on data protection. So the framework aims to provide guidance to countries through a number of recommendations and proposed actions, uh, aims to guide the member states to develop their national data systems and capabilities in a coherent and harmonized way that enable interoperability between data systems across the continent and also facilitate data flow between countries and uh, between sectors. So the framework emphasizes uh, the importance of uh, cooperation between countries and uh, enabling data to, uh, to flow across uh, borders. And for this, we need to create healthy and secure environments through uh, the adequate mechanisms and frameworks. For this, the, the frameworks recommends a number of actions that we need to take at uh, continental level and also at the regional level. So after the adoption of this framework, we moved towards the development of an implementation plan and also a self-capacity assessment tool uh, uh, we, that aims to support countries to, to domesticate this framework. And also as for us as uh, institutions, it, it aims to help us to identify the individual and uh, collective needs of country when it comes to human and uh, technical capacity. This activity and the whole development of this framework is made with support of our partner uh, GIZ and they take the opportunity of this session to thank them. So the, the framework is being complemented by additional frameworks like uh, uh, this year we worked on development of guidelines on integrating data in the digital trade agreements and we have put the document at the disposal of the negotiators on the FCFTA protocols we aim to raise awareness and also to explain the key aspects that needs to be taken into account in digital trade agreements. And also we aim to create the conditions that enable uh, an efficient use of data. And there is other frameworks that are in the, in the process of being developed, such as the data sharing and data categorization frameworks. And also there is work towards developing an open data strategy. As Alison mentioned, in addition to this uh, continental framework, there is other frameworks that support this uh, digital uh, transition, such as the digital transformation strategy and also the digital uh, ID, which is uh, the aim to uh, create interoperability. And when it comes to data, we developed a continental strategy on crea creating an enabling environment for digital single market, where data market is identified as one of the pillars and uh, we aim that the outcome of this session will contribute to the development to the development of this data market through the development of the key capacities and also the harmonization 
of policies and regulations. I think I can stop here and they may come back if there is any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Suhila. And definitely we will come back to, to many of those um, points that you've raised. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Trudy Hartzenberg, who's the Executive Director of the Trade Law Center, Trellick, many of you know it as, um, to speak a little bit as about the um, African uh, Continental Free Trade um, Agreement negotiations that are currently on, um, particularly the committee's work on, on digital trade, um, because I think there's a new round this morning, starting in Kigali, or maybe started yesterday, but it's very current right now. Maybe Paul will also tell us a little bit more about that. Um, but Trudy, hopefully you are still with us online so early in the morning. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Alice, and good morning, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to join you from Cape Town this morning. As Alison has indicated, we're joining um, this discussion during the week of the fourth meeting of the Committee on Digital Trade. It started on Monday, and um, I'm pleased to provide a little bit of an update on the digital trade negotiations. Colleagues, digital trade came onto the AFCFDA agenda in 2021, when the discussion was focusing very much on e-commerce. Last year, when the negotiations began, this was broadened to a much bigger scope agenda covering digital trade aspects more generally, so digitally ordered and digitally delivered trade. So it covers aspects such as cloud services, streaming, gaming, and, and a whole range of very important developmental areas for um, particularly youth entrepreneurs on the economy, so it holds significant potential. The legal instrument is a very comprehensive one covering many aspects, not only of data governance, but also taking into account the uneven levels of development of policy, laws and institutions across the continent. So we see chapters on market access and treatment of digital products, facilitation of digital trade, the broad data governance agenda, business and consumer trust, digital inclusion, a very important topic, particularly for small, medium and micro enterprises, emerging trends, technologies and innovation, institutional arrangements, and a very important focus on technical assistance, capacity building, and cooperation to deal with these various of levels of development. Following extensive stakeholder consultations, the Committee on Digital Trade was established. It has prepared a draft protocol and several rounds of meetings and negotiations have been concluded. However, there are important outstanding issues that the fourth committee meeting is considering. The process is then that the draft will go to the senior trade officials meeting. This is really where the negotiations take place. This will take place in the next few days. Once that is finalized, then that draft protocol will be considered by the Council of Ministers. That meeting takes place at the end of October. And then the final process is the adoption by the African Union Assembly. So bringing us back to the broader African Union context, keeping in mind, of course, that the AFCFDA is also a flagship project of the African Union, and hence the important connections to the number of instruments and initiatives that Suhila has mentioned this morning. The outstanding issues on the negotiating agenda include a number of important da data governance issues. For example, we're taking a look at cross-border data transfers, the location of computing facilities, source code is also not agreed yet, customs duties remains a very contentious issue on digital transactions, and then the issue of alignment of national policy and legal frameworks with the continental framework is particularly important to, to keep in mind as well. So this is not yet agreed. So in brief, um, Alison, this is a little bit of an update as to where we are at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Trudy, and trying to keep these complex uh, issues down to the, the three minutes that we've got for each speaker in the first round. Um, 
I think with the ending on the point around the importance of alignment, um, maybe if we can jump to Paul and then we'll, we'll follow with um, Alexander as an argo. Um, Paul, you've been, um, that's Paul Baker, I should have been said in the first instance, is the founder and CEO of International Economics Consulting and chairman of the African Trade Foundation. Um, among other things, he's also a visiting professor at the College of Europe, lecturer um, at the um, University of Mauritius, where he's based. Um, Paul, perhaps just to pick up on that last point that uh, Trudy was making about the importance of aligning the African continent of free trade um, uh, agreement, um, area agreements with the data policy framework, the African Union data policy framework, um, your job's been precisely to, to look at, to try and support that alignment. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, Alison, and a pleasure to be here as well and, and have this discussion with you. Um, yeah, first of all, data policy, of course, is really at the cornerstone of digital services. Um, it's really important that uh, data is treated uh, responsibly and ethically, of course, across borders. Um, and having that certainty as well as to how different jurisdictions are treating the data is going to be essential for cross-border trade, so to sort of reinforce the AFCFTA. Uh, as Suila mentioned, the AU's uh, data policy framework is quite innovative. It really sets out some of the core principles that need to be adopted at the African Union level, and these have been embodied, I think, in the ASFTA uh, protocol of digital trade negotiations as well. Uh, so just to re-emphasize what Suila said, really the free and secure flow of data is, is really embedded in that, in that uh, AU data policy framework. Uh, upholding human rights, uh, looking at security, equitable access to the benefits of data, so not just access to the data, but the benefits of data. Um, and have then also considering the different diversity of development levels and technology levels across the continent, so also ensuring these principles of inclusivity, uh, interoperability, uh, innovation and accountability have also been highlighted throughout that uh, policy framework. So the protocol on digital trade, uh, as, as Trudy mentioned, has um, be, been negotiated and has been widened. It was originally indeed uh, just meant to be an e-commerce uh, protocol and now it's risen to digitally delivered services as well. So it is a bit more comprehensive than, than, than before. Um, and uh, under Suila's leadership, we, we developed this guide to try and uh, have some model texts that could be used in the negotiations of that protocol uh, using uh, examples from other digital economic partnership agreements or digital agreements that have been digital economy agreements that have been negotiated in other countries. Um, and so what we look at is things like cross-border uh, transfer of, of, of data. We look at uh, data protection, um, primarily personal data protection, uh, looking at uh, data innovation, uh, open data, uh, interoperability uh, across countries, uh, inclusivity, um, and then special considerations for um, countries that are at different stages of development uh, so that we allow their domestic frameworks to evolve um, and to be prepared for integrating these things. So um, <laughs> there is quite a lot to say, but uh, yeah, I'll pass it back on to you and, and we'll take some questions afterwards. Sorry, uh, we can't hear you. Um, so I, I think you know the important um, challenge here is really going to be around the implementation and the domestication at the national um, level, so that these enabling frameworks actually are you know interoperable and uh, and possible and fair. Um, so we'll definitely have to come back to Sahila on the second phase of the data policy framework, which, unlike a lot of the other frameworks that have um, founded and uh, you know, challenges of implementation, there is the second very important capacity building phase that's going to make this all, all possible, hopefully. Um, but uh, before we get back to, to Sahila, um, Alexander Izanagu um, is the director of the um, AFCTA Policy and Development Centre. He's an expert in international law, um, trade and investment, and tax, and he holds a doctorate from um, McGill uh, University. And Alexander, perhaps you could just talk to us a little bit about um, 
you know, at, at both the national, at the national and the continental level, and obviously this has also very significant international um, aspects to it, how these frameworks are going to shape the, the landscape of data flows that are going to be so critical um, for the kind of economies of sc scope and scale that we need on the continent to be able to engage internationally. Oh no, uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Apologies, it's 4 a.m. So I'm trying not to be in news on the tour. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, definitely, thank you for the invitation, as I said. So when we look at sort of data flow and data governance, Kenya becomes a very clear example around what data, um, what data sort of um, generation could look like, right? And I'm sure anyone who's fo who followed the recent event around WorldCoin will sort of see why both the continent and national data regulation and data governance is very important, um, simply because how you generate the data would also sort of define the acceptability of that data in the first in the first instance. But before we sort of go in, into around data governance itself, the question becomes more around um, data sort of data um, uh, data penetration in terms of internet access, and and that's something that Kenya and most African countries are also trying to deal with. However, um, however, as I mentioned by other speakers, there are existing frameworks um, around the African Union, the AFCFT digital protocol, and other sort of um, frameworks that sort of tend to bring about a multi-stakeholder collaboration. And I think the multi-stakeholder collaboration is, is sort of relevant in being able to sort of achieve a, a digital trade, right, which is what the AFCFT is, um, is, um, looks to achieve. So thinking about it generally, they would, they would sort of understand that on one hand, data be is, is the lifeblood of digital trade in Africa. But to be able to sort of achieve that particular um, um, success, then it, there are quite a number of things that, that need to be put in place. One is that interconnectivity and broadband expansion at national, regional, and continental levels, um, fostering infrastructure sharing and affordability becomes one aspect that must be considered. Second, again, is creating a, a, a conducive regulatory environment. And this is what, again, the other speakers have mentioned. Um, how do we sort of... Um, domesticate the, the African Union digital framework in many African countries, but understanding the local nuances of those digital framework, right? And, and none of that come to play in that particular instance. Um, same, pro, same provision of, of, you know, of data usage and generation in Kenya may be different from one in sort of, you know, um, in Sharia compliant country. And, and, and I will see this a lot when you're looking at data generation and how you do the balance. So creating that regulatory environment and adapting that regulatory environment uh, to different countries would be very essential. Again, investment in green ICT, in green ICT and sustainable, and, and sustainable policies would be one. Kenya at the moment is sort of working around um, the digital last mile, right? What does that mean in, in terms of digital last mile, in terms of connectivity, but also in terms of um, generation and the use of the data becomes something else that is that is completely important to think about. And then, and then finally, also it's sort of looking at. At, at how we educate people on this on, on this data governance. Again, a clear example again is this recent incident with WorldCoin, where where there was a lot of uh, media and public um, um, you know um, discussion around what that data, what that data generation process looks like, but also again what the data use looks like. So even just the ownership of data, I'm sure some of you may know of the of the plan to have a digital ID in Kenya, but even just the background conversation around who accesses and creates that digital ID because something to think about. Before I stop, also to think about how do we fund our data, our data generation and data flow. Um, this is something just to think about that the same way we discuss sovereign issues um, in the political and economic space, it's also important that we think about sovereign issues in financing the digital space. Now, for most African countries, where you do not have the finances to fund your data process and data generation, and you have foreign you know, donors like your Bill, um, Bill Gates Foundation and other foundations coming to fund your, your data generation, either to digital ID and other, um, and other tools and devices. Uh, who, who owns the data and who manages the data, right? So again, that, that, that conversation we're beginning to see in practice where many African countries are beginning to re renegotiate some of these um, donor um, grants because, because they wouldn't own that the data being generated by those donors, even though the data might communicate, um, might communicate in a digital ID for the country, but the data ownership and and use of that data, something again that is worrisome. So, 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 so that's some of the discussions that we see, and why having a, a sort of a harmonized continental framework as as being proposed by the AU is important, but also understanding that different countries have different nuances, 
different culture, different religions, different policies, different principles, and adapting those continental um, um, frameworks in, to be able to benefit and fit into the different um, values of different countries. I think that's sort of a good place to just make a summary. Uh, thank you so much for that, um, Alexander. And you, you raised the really important um, points on essentially kind of preconditions, except that we can't wait long enough to get those all in place before we deal with the data policy frameworks. So um, very important points. And perhaps Sahila can actually come back to this because I think what distinguishes the data, govern uh, the data policy framework from many of the kind of international digital services and some of the GDPR and those kinds of things is that it's got a very, like half the first half of a report is actually about you know, creating the enabling environment that you would need to do to get, you know, alignment across the continent. And with this very strong notion of progressive realization of these uh, very high level um, human rights centered um, principles that are in, in the, uh, contained in the document. But then as Suhila mentioned, these foundational um, infrastructures that you would also require before um, you are going to see the benefits of, of, of uh, data economy. Um, so at that um, point, perhaps we can actually um, ask um, uh, Liping uh, Zhang from, uh, the, from uh, UNCTAD, who she's uh, the chief of, the S of science and technology innovation policy section. Um, she's previously worked as deputy director general in China's Ministry of Commerce, um, where she served in several positions for over two decades. So lots of evolution with the technology in this, in this area. But also the um, UNCTAD was part of the uh, task team of the African Union and has worked very closely on this. And we've obviously also um, in Africa and in within the African Union, there was a strong drawing on the fabulous um, information uh, uh, reports that the, that the uh, um, UNCTAD produced. And um, please tell us how we fared now that, we've, now that we're done. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. Um, good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, uh, let me uh, <laughs> introduce myself. Also, another head that I ha had with myself. Uh, I'm also uh, leading a team that provides uh, uh, secretary service and uh, substantive sub support to the UN Commission on Science Technology for Development. Uh, and the work that Alison has mentioned actually is done by another branch, but the colleague is not able to make it today, so she ask, he asked me to also is it speak on his behalf. Um, it's indeed a very good opportunity for me to participate in this meeting because the UN Commission, CSED, in short, is also looking at uh, um, the data issue, including data governance, under the um, actually a uh, kind of uh, uh, invitation from General Assembly. And so uh, I'm very glad to hear the different uh, perspectives uh, at this uh, meeting today. So let me start by congratulating the EU Commission and uh, EU Commission and African Member States for the development of the data policy framework. In our view, uh, this framework uh, can serve uh, as a very good basis to strengthen data policies across Africa. And I think, uh, and the previous speakers have already mentioned how this uh, uh, policy framework uh, will be useful uh, at uh, the continental level and also for the member states in the AU. And from um, our perspective as an international organization, we want to say that uh, this policy uh, framework also helps the African countries actually to participate uh, in the forthcoming international discussions or, in fact, uh, the ongoing discussions in different uh, settings in the UN system about uh, uh, data policies and data governance issues. Um, UNCTAD has been calling for a kind of coordinating mechanism in the UN system to deal with uh, these issues because uh, currently there are uh, multi multiple settings or processes that are um, dealing with this issue. And uh, in fact, uh, member states uh, um, have uh, um, expressed a kind of, uh, uh, in particular from developing countries, the difficulty to follow up these different processes. So uh, we think that uh, this kind of common approach uh, uh, at the e AU level uh, even though we see they are not going to be prescriptive, prescriptive for the member states, but they will definitely provide uh, uh, a guidance to the uh, member states of the AU to participate in these international discussions. So we really uh, think that this is a very good uh, uh, step um, by the AU. And I heard from our colleague from the AU that uh, the next steps will be our capacity building and development of action plans for the uh, AU level and also for the member states. And this is also very important. Uh, indeed, uh, 
in fact, uh, our, uh, actually, see, we have prepared a, a report like this. This is the second draft, and when I was, I'm here. Actually, my colleagues have developed a third draft about uh, data for development uh, that we are going to discuss uh, in Lisbon in November, and we find that uh, uh, for developing countries, uh, in order to benefit from the data uh, arrow and um, capacity building uh, skills, uh, it is very uh, lacking, um, which can be reflected in different aspects. Uh, in fact, uh, not only in the infrastructure uh, that is needed to generate data, to uh, collect, to store, analyze, and also use the data, but also the, um, the human ca uh, capacity and to uh, to really uh, do this kind of uh, work. In fact, uh, uh, data is just one word, but uh, data is in fact uh, a value chain. As I've mentioned, there are different links in this value chain, and in each uh, link of the value chain, there is indeed a need for developing countries to build uh, capacities. So we hope that uh, uh, this uh, policy framework developed by the AU will really help the African member states to benefit from uh, data through capacity building. Of course, there's a need for uh, development uh, partners like uh, <laughs> GIZ to provide uh, uh, support, in particular financial support, to the AU member states uh, in order to achieve that, uh, uh, that purpose. And we have heard a lot, actually, in the past uh, uh, two days, discussions on global digital compact and on our, uh, digital uh, um benefits, etc. There's indeed uh, a big lack of uh, uh, financing for developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Li Ping. Thank you very much, Li Ping. Um, I think we'll be there's lots of to come back to on the data for development, which we <coughs> obviously I think are now in a much better position to engage in some of those discussions, which I think African voices have been very absent from um, uh, member state voices in the in the past. So I think that's a um, a very welcome development. And then I am, we, we will come back um, and ask uh, Sohila to speak a little bit more about the second phase, the implementation phase, which is in fact already underway. Um, and the, um, data, the data policy framework report um, was up on the, the screen, but in fact there's also the published um, implementation, which is actually the action plan, the implementation framework, which um, includes both a capacity building self-assessment tool for countries, which will... Um, facilitate you know, support through, through, the, through the AU, so we can definitely come back to that. And of course, that, that has been made possible, as you mentioned, with um, GIZ support. Um, so let me go to um, Martin Wimmer, um, who's the Director of Ger General Development Policy Issues at Germany's Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and perhaps, Martin, you could really speak to us about the priorities that have been identified for implementation, but also how those um, align to you know, global challenges that we're facing, and particularly the achievement of the SDGs. Yeah, thank you. Money is lacking, but we're doing our best. Um, BMZ and the German government have joined forces with other European member states and partners to support the African Union in this endeavor. BMZ has committed 20 million euros to the data governance initiative that supports the implementation of the AU data policy framework in 10 to 15 partner countries. The initiative will provide a total of 57 million euro in European contributions to harmonize data politi policies on the continent and to support the foundation for data-driven society and economies in African partner countries. It will focus on three key areas, data policy, data value creation, data infrastructure, and uh, as you said, um, reaching the SDGs is at the heart of BMZ's work. The 2030 agenda emphasizes the importance of high quality, accessible and timely data for sustainable development. And for instance, with the Data for Policy initiative, uh, we support data-based policy making in our partner countries in order to make evidence-based decisions in the interest of citizens, or um, we are concerned with combating inequality in data sets. The feminist development policy prioritized by Minister Svenja Schulz is guiding our action in this regard. And as a last example, the BMZ Data Lab and the Data for Policy Initiative in collaboration with international partners such as Paris 21 and the UNDP are supporting the integration of a gender data lab in the National Statistics Office in Rwanda. 
Yeah, finally, using data for achieving the SDGs, people and companies need digital and technical skills. Beam sets therefore supports the public sector, the private sector, civil society, especially young women in acquiring the necessary knowledge about digitalization. Keeping that short and um, allowing us to also just take a quick round of comments from the panelists who might have questions to each other. I can see lots of uh, intersections, but perhaps just starting off with Sohila before I turn to each of you and see if you do have questions of each other. Um, Sohila, perhaps if you wouldn't mind returning to f firstly some of the, I mean, the, so much has been covered here, but maybe just also to speak about the implementation framework um, and then, of course, respond to the other questions on data flows that you'd like to. Okay, thank you, Alison, and also thank you to the panelists for making reference to the to the framework. I think, as, uh, as you mentioned, now we move to the second phase of the implementation because, like, we're after the development process and also the adoption of this framework, now we started the implementation with development of an implementation plan that identifies uh, key actions that needs to be taken both at national level, regional and continental level. And also we come up with, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the self-capacity -capa assessment tool, which aims to, to develop kind of tailored uh, technical assistance to each country, like to, we, because like we aim to, uh, to accompany our member states in the implementation, because like, uh, in Africa, we have noticed that implementation is uh, is a challenge. Sometimes you come up with very good frameworks and policies, but the implementations sometimes takes uh, years uh, for this uh, data policy framework. And knowing the ongoing uh, uh, discussion at global level about the data governance and the importance of data to support the development of digital economy and society, and also to feed the development of other uh, technologies we started working on the implementation and we engage with member states to uh, support them in the development of their national data governance systems and also their uh, capacities. And also we come up with a, a number of capacity building uh, workshops that we came to promote this framework and also to build the capacity of the policy makers and experts on uh, data related issues. Uh, when it comes to the objective uh, of the framework, and also I would to, to comment on the the representative of UNCTAD, I think the framework, as I mentioned earlier, reflects a common approach, but also it it reflects a reality of a continent because our countries they are not all at the same level of uh, advancement of digital readiness and also. Uh, uh, data uh, data maturity. So for us, we have to adapt to to the situation, and also the framework reflects what uh, what the African countries aim to achieve with regard to data. We aim to create that balance between the ensuring uh, value creation, supporting development of, of economy, but also at the same time. Uh, ensuring the necessary uh, uh, protections of the African citizens and also the protection of African economies, because we know that digital economy is uh, is global because there is no borders in digital economy and African countries they are building their capacities in their field in this field and they aim to 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 create the necessary conditions for the uh, development of new uh, business models and also to, to be part of the, of the global digital uh, uh, trade uh, system. So it is what they can say uh, at this level, but the, some countries, they have started already developing their national data policies. And also we are very uh, uh, happy to see the progress because there is uh, progress from all uh, levels, like some countries, they are working on their legislations for personal data protection and other countries, they move towards like developing national uh, data policies. And at the regional and continental level, we started working uh, to develop the necessary uh, mechanism that will facilitate collaboration and cooperation among uh, member states. It is what I can say, and uh, I am happy to take any other question. Thank you. Thank you um, very much for that, uh, Suhila. And I'm just wondering if any of the panelists want to pick up on, on anything. I, I think um, a number of people, um, Alexander and Paul, you both mentioned the importance of um, 
interconnectivity and interoperability. And I think in the continent, in the data policy framework, we uh, you know there is we identify a number of kind of low hanging fruits that one could achieve. Uh, particularly kind of in the context of the continental free trade area and getting things moving as quickly as possible. As we mentioned, some very high level, ambitious, aspirational um, principles in the, in the document. Um, but there are certain things that we've got to get going right away. And I think one of those that's identified is the um, technical standards that could be put into place quite easily so that we, there is standardization amongst national um, uh, systems and um, and for cross-border um, flows as well, that could immediately open up the kind of interoperability that we need for the um, continental free trade area. So you know, while there are these bigger issues and the capacity building that has to be done, there do seem to be some immediate things that we can get some momentum on to, in support of the continental free trade area. Martin. Yes, Suhila just said uh, there are no borders in the digital economy. I don't believe that, actually. Um, once the phrases information superhighway and then data highway were highly popular, we don't use it anymore, but the analogy was helpful. Imagine a highway, a truck, and its load. What countries regulate when they regulate data are actually data packages full of goods. We use the abstract term data, but what we're really talking about is knowledge, education, news, music, art, products, software, identities, rights, money. That's what data is. Data is commodities. The seemingly immaterial data in reality materializes every time it is used, and every country needs those goods, just like energy or food. So it makes a lot of sense to stimulate and regulate this data traffic, this online exchange of goods in a society and economy, and especially because just like real highways, data crosses borders. Countries don't want diseases and terrorists to cross their borders, and countries don't want spyware or fake news to cross their digital borders. And on the other hand, the more sets of rules you encounter on your network of data highways, the more customs you have to pay at the border, the more difficult and expensive it gets, but also maybe the safer is the travel. That's why the United States, the European Union, the African Union, they all try to break down barriers, break down barriers, and make digital goods easily, inexpensively, and safely available for their citizens, which is a good thing, even if companies try to tell us sometimes it's not. And I'm explaining this because I don't believe in this narrative that exploiting big data is a must for economic growth, let alone that growth is helpful for decarbonizing our global economies. From my point of view, the goal is not data markets which drive sales for a few tech companies, but the goal is open data in an open internet for everyone. That's the goal. So <laughs> that these um, data flows are very, you know, asymmetrical in and out of um, Africa, and that at the currently Africa has very little um, control or enforcement. And so I think an important, you know, aspect of us speaking about domestication and about regional harmonisation is that in fact many of these issues will not be enforced without global governance and global cooperation. And so alignment of these. Na you know, national objectives, which are, I should point out in the document, <laughs> like many other, of the default commercial value creation. There's a strong emphasis on public value creation um, because of the, a lot of the data actually sits in the public data that's collected of the n numbers of people who are offline. <laughs> the data that is collected sits with, with, that, with the public sector. And so, you know, um, enormous potential there in terms of reali realizing some of the public value that's attached to that. Can we take a round of questions from the floor. I, I'm just going to quickly chip in on, on what Paul had said. If yes, please go ahead, Alexander, while we wait for some questions. If the people on in the room, I'm afraid 
so that I, not I'm afraid, but you'll have to stand in front of the microphone so that the online people will be able to hear you. So if you just come to the mic. No, no, uh, thanks, thanks. I, I think there's sort of two aspects I just want to quickly refer to, right? One is, um, and I think Paul made a reference to it, it's around how we sort of demoralize or moralize data collection and data usage. Now again, given a particular example, we see this with um, with with um, the conversation between Kenya and TikTok, right? And how some some sects of, of, of the Kenyan government sort of believe that TikTok tends to uh, tends to corrupt the morality of of young people, and that sort of you know points into what we're doing with data and how we use data and how we perceive data. So it's important also that in that data governance, um, there's a need for a continental standard on what kind of uh, moral persuasion and relationship data has with our cultural values. Otherwise, then we could see a stop to data penetration simply because of those kind of moral value. That's one. But two, also, there's something else we've seen across African countries. It is the implementation of digital service taxation, right? So if you're trying to also trade data and also sort of, you know, be in the digital trade space, the question becomes, how do you harmonize the tax aspect of that? Because again, if you do not harmonize the tax aspect of that, what would happen again is that you find countries um, creating barriers to data penetration. So we've seen this again in countries where, for example, Netflix has been blocked, Facebook has been blocked, Twitter has been blocked because the government believes that this, this, these are extraterritorial and that you want to get um, to share the revenue from these from these companies. And because again, you do not have sort of an uh, harmonization of, of tax laws within the AFCFT, then you have a non-tariff barrier to, to uh, successfully implementing the AFCFT, right? So again, it, uh, again, while the AFCFT is, you know, is good so far, there are, there are, I, I, I'm sort of focusing on, on other aspects. There are other non-tariff barriers like tax issues, I'm analyzing those tax laws that sort of would affect um, the digital trade and, 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 and data generation and data flow. So that we also look at it holistically to say we have an issue of defining defining the role of data in morality in the society. And if data should have any role in that particular morality conversation. But also secondly, is also the issue of, 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 um, of um, taxation of this revenue from data, taxation of data itself. Is it an asset? Is it a, a flow? And how do countries also come to treat that thing? I think a continental framework would assist simply because companies would better um, you know, uh, manage this relationship at the continental level other, other than having different agreements with different national governments. So I thought again to put some, some context into the conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alexander. I think um, the issue of, uh, you know, moral alignment is an enormous challenge on the continent. I think it's a con challenge globally. Um, interesting and provocative question. Hopefully somebody from the room will also respond to that. But um, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name is Morton. I'm from UNUE Gov, and we work with a number of countries and, and regional partners on things like data governance. So while it's great that there's an AU framework coming in play, and you're also addressing the need for capacities, one of the things we know from our work with countries like China or the Europeans or even in Tanzania and Rwanda, we see that there's also informal processes that are essential, particularly within organizations, when it comes to data management and quality assurance. So one thing is having the interoperability frameworks on a national level, regional level, even an institutional level, and having formal processes for ensuring who access what data in what situations, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, there is the informal processes in terms of quality assurance. So what happens if we see that there is data that looks wrong, suspicious? Morton is 130 years old based on the data we get from the population registry or he earns $3 billion a year. There seem to be something wrong. What is the process for clarifying that question, both internally but also with the data manager of that data set? And this is something we see that, for instance, the Tanzanians are trying to grapple with around um, financial data from the M-Pesa systems and for uh, mini bucks companies like the micro enterprises when they're trying to capture that. What is the process to manage this data? We see the same reflected when we speak to social security agencies in, in the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security in China where they are trying to grapple with data from 4,000 different government actors in this area, or from the French, or from the Danes, or from the Australians, or the Rwandans. So those are the type of things that I think is really important when you talk about 
the capacity development, that it's not just about the formal framework and compliance with that. It's also about the internal processes, both formal and informal, to ensure that the data is actually correct. And that's a key challenge. So how are you addressing that? And what's the, uh, the experiences in this room to, to address that in a constructive and positive way? answer that question um, because it's you know it's came up in the task force and that and this the framework is very much trying to set the enabling framework the actual data management and those kinds of standards and things in, within companies are obviously something that have to be taken up at the domestic level depending on the country and the circumstances and the levels of capacity building required often it's quite advanced in some of the financial systems you know, systems and less advanced in others. But, you know, this is a broad framework um, for harmonization and kind of national guidelines as opposed to, you know, kind of um, company, national policy for companies on, on managing data. Thank you so much. Next okay. question. Good morning to everyone. My name is uh, Oliver Bamenju. I am a member of Parliament in Cameroon. I want to start by uh, sincerely thanking uh, GIZ for their support uh, towards uh, this uh, data program in Africa and to say that uh, um, uh, the issue of uh, data in Africa, it is something that is new. Many countries are not, uh, they don't even have um, legal instrument on data and uh, I think that we have to start by making sure that we popularize the, the African Union uh, data policy framework uh, so that we can, so that it can go, it can be uh, domesticated uh, both at the national and regional level, and sub-regional level. Secondly, uh, we are all aware about the Malabo Convention that uh, discusses three themes, uh, personal data protection, electronic comments and uh, cyber crime and cyber se uh, security. So why will you be advising African countries to push with the ratification of the Malabo Convention that discusses, uh, also include data protection, or you'll be advising African countries to, to push for, for, for a deeper look uh, into the, Af the African Union data policy framework. That's, uh, that's a kind of uh, advice African country because yesterday I was having a discussion with some authorities back home and they were telling me, Honorable, how do you want us to carry two things at the same time? You are telling, you are on our neck that we should ratify the Malabo conventions that gives uh, an African reality on all of this. And you are on our neck again that we should ratify the Budapest convention <laughs> that gives, the, that talks about the same thing with the two additional protocols. And then again, you are coming again with the African Union uh, poli the data policy framework. What do you, where should, we, where should we start? So from here, you can, uh, you can, you can advise us on how we can, how we can tackle this bit. Like I, like I said, the, uh, Thank this you. program of the African Union, um, uh, the, the AU data policy framework is a, is a good one. And uh, please do everything possible to be the capacities of uh, political leaders and leaders in Africa so that they can be able to own this thing. They can own it and carry the message back home. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Honorable MP. Um, absolutely. I think, again, something I'm going to have to ask um, uh, Sahila to, to, to answer for us, but a lot of discussion during this process of uh, you know, whether the uh, Malabo Convention requires, you know, it's now so out of date, but it actually has got all the fundamentals. It's in line with Budapest. It's in line with the African Union. So, you know, I, th I, th I think it's not a problematic, but it does need to be understood. And I think you're right that there's not a lot of, you know, awareness around lots of, lots of these processes. So, um, uh, so Hila will have to take that one as well. Um, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll just uh, take one question from... The, uh the uh, online uh, Thank you. participants. Uh, does the AU framework take into account foreign private co uh, corporate uh, data col uh, collection? Okay, so again, it, it, it does address that. So we'll ask Sahila to do that. And uh, would you introduce yourself? Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Alison. My name is Liz Rembo, a research fellow at uh, Research ICT Africa. I'm not asking this question as an insider because I haven't worked on data governance uh, project. So uh, my question um, addresses or particularly raises question on uh, capacity and use by SMEs and uh, other higher levels uh, of organizations. So how does the Africa, Africa Data Policy Framework and uh, its implementation framework um, tackle the issues of capacity and use and uh, in relation to very few organizations in Africa uh, collecting so large uh, amounts of data and uh, SMEs collecting some amounts of data significant but not being able to use it. So in the continent we already have so much data but uh, the people collecting it are working in silos, so there's no movement, there's no usage. So how does the framework address that as well? Thank you. Related uh, to her or directed at her. So, Suhila, if you could please um, answer some of those questions and then I'll quickly go around the panel one last word. And apologies for the shortness of your contributions. Okay, thank you, Alison, and uh, thank you for the questions. I would start by the question of the, the representative of the parliamentarian about the capacity building and also what is the difference between the AU data policy framework and the Malabo convention. And uh, I would say that we, the capacity building is uh, very important and we, it is, uh, many, there are many recommendations on capacity building uh, in the framework because our countries, they are aware about the need to develop the capacity at all levels from the policy makers to the development of data protection authorities to the development of the data professional task forces, uh, workforces across the countries. There is a huge need for uh, development uh, data. And there is even a proposal that uh, either existing institution or create a new institution to take care about this uh, aspect. And uh, the work is ongoing. This year, we started organizing capacity building workshops for representative of the countries. We invite a representative of the ministries or policy makers and also the data protection authorities but the work is really ongoing that we can work with uh, as many uh, representatives as we can and also there is work that will be done at national level the malabo convention it enters it to force this year now it is uh, the instrument that uh, regulates the data protection, the cyber crime, and also the electronic transaction across the continent. It is a binding instrument, and uh, countries now the, who are ratified the, the instrument, they are committed to, to, to align their national legislation and to ensure that there is, uh, 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 there is, there is a, they comply with the Malabo Convention. And the, Mal the AU Data Policy Framework is the policy framework. It is high level recommendations. It aims to provide guidance to shape the data uh, governance and data policy across the continent. But countries, they, are, uh, they will, do uh, will internalize or domesticate, depends on their national context. It's not like uh, uh, the Malabo Convention, which is an instrument, it is binding instrument. And for us, there is a complementarity between data policy framework and the Malabo Convention. As well as the part related to personal data protection, it is uh, driven from the Malabo Convention. The second question, I, I could not uh, get it, but so the Hila, last one. Sorry, yes. because you because you didn't get the last question, and we will um, speak to people in the room afterwards if you don't mind, because it's a online session. The um, uh, organizers are absolutely brutal about this. We're simply going to be cut off in a couple of minutes. So I'm just going to ask Sohila if you would indulge us just to ask the um, panelists who haven't spoken just to say a couple of words um, in closing um, as we close off. So Paul, would you like to? Okay, let me let me just at uh, one minute. Um, just I think a very very important point. The Malabo Convention uh, took nine years to get um, Im implemented. It was adopted nine years ago, but it has only started to become in force uh, recently. So one of the big problems is the commitment and the time it takes for countries to actually 
uh, implement some of these instruments. Indeed, Suila mentions these are guidelines, uh, the data policy framework, so these are the principles that we need to adopt so we can check whether we're implementing against those principles or are we going against those principles, so it's quite important. And then just finally, just to say that on the implementation side, we need to get the equivalence in GDPR, for example, on data protection. Uh, there isn't currently recognition of different people's uh, countries' regimes. Even the countries in Africa that have implemented GDPR-compliant EU legislation are not recognized by the EU as being compliant with the GDPR. Therefore, there is no equivalence, which means you cannot share data between the European Union subjects and African subjects. That's a big problem, and that needs to be uh, rectified to be able to take advantage of data frameworks. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Paul. If I can ask Trudy, in our remaining seconds, please come and in and say a few words. Thank you so much, Alison. Just briefly to acknowledge that data policy and governance is very much a cross-cutting policy area and governance area. And um, I do want to note the implementation challenges of the AFCFDA, not only the protocol on digital trade, but its connections to the other protocols, trade and services, competition, intellectual property rights, and so on. They all contain provisions related to data, data governance, and consumer protection and related issues. The technical assistance, which is going to be required at national level to embed those commitments effectively in our data policy and governance frameworks is a very important consideration. So our development partners, certainly we will need their assistance to be able to achieve those objectives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Trudy and Liping. Thank you, Elison. Um, I just want to make three points. The first point is that uh, there's a question about the uh, informal process and uh, uh, quality assurance. Uh, um, I think uh, this question actually reflects a kind of uh, common uh, a question among us, which is, we actually haven't understood the data well. There are many uh, unanswered questions or pending things that we need to consider deeply. And as Martin has mentioned already, uh, data is an economic input, so it can be materialized. But uh, on the other hand, data is more than just an input because it can also inform our policy making. And so I, I, I'm not sure, because I haven't read this policy framework. I hope that the data policy framework, all the action plans, capacity building, and at AU level, we also address this aspect of data. It's not just an economic input, but also uh, it informs policy making, which is also equally important. important. Uh, and regarding to ensure quality assurance, in fact, there is need for standards. In particular, for example, uh, what kind of metadata should be uh, uh, subject, uh, so what kind of standards should the metadata uh, be subject to? That will uh, help a lot to improve the quality of the, of the data. Secondly, to strengthen public data uh, ability. Uh, this is also a recommendation that we have put. Uh, and then um, I, I want to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, it's very good for AU to uh, have this kind of cooperation to be highlighted in this data policy, fr data policy framework because uh, at the global level, cooperation in data area is also very important. And with this kind of cooperation experience at AU level, I think it will definitely provide a good example of also uh, in the international cooperation and discussions. I think this is, must be the first uh, largest uh, kind of uh, continental level um, data policy framework. So I really congratulate AU for that. Thank you very much. component precisely on public value creation. Of course, there is a section on commercial value creation. We definitely need to grow that in the content, but the public value creation, which includes the use of public data for public purposes. But of course, importantly, going to some of the questions we haven't answered on the floor, also the um, management of that data and access to that data and open data frameworks, protected open data frameworks um, for um, preferential use potentially by African countries among themselves and also for local, you know, local entrepreneurship and innovation. So there's a lot of, um, you know, policy and strategic opportunities for local value creation and public value creation, particularly for public planning. So um, it's just about getting this all done now. So <laughs> uh, big, big challenge ahead of us. Thank you so much um, for all your, your time and your inputs. And thanks very much um, to Alexander. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get back to you. I think you had a little bit of a nice provocative questions. We'll have to pick up some an another time. Um, and to Trudy, Martin, 
Le Ping and Paul, thank you so much. Thank you. Let me use this opportunity to invite you to the two events. One is UNCTAD e-commerce e-week e uh, on 4th to 8th December in Geneva. Another is the CICD uh, uh, discussion on data for development in Lisbon on 6th and 7th uh, November. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>